More patience than first thought. The questions raised by Midstate mom who says her five-year-old could have been exposed to HIV or hepatitis during a colonoscopy at Vanderbilt. Plus, untouchable, why the family of a 10-year-old girl killed in a hit and run may never see justice. Plus, Americans drowning in debt. What has so many underwater financially and what this could mean for all of us. Fox 17 News at 9 starts now. Middle Tennessee's only prime time news. This is Fox 17 News at 9, your code red station. I'm scared. Continuing coverage tonight on Vanderbilt patients potentially exposed to HIV or hepatitis during colonoscopies. Good evening, everybody. I'm Scott Couch. Fox 17 News is now hearing from the mother of a five year old who says she received a letter telling her about her daughter's possible exposure. Now, her child's procedure happened before Vanderbilt's admitted window surrounding equipment sterilization issues. Fox 17 News Karen Aguilar live outside the Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt to tell us about this latest patient's claims. Scott, the child's mom tells me she took her here to Vanderbilt's Children's Hospital for a medical procedure, then telling me she was terrified after receiving this letter saying her daughter could have been exposed to HIV or hepatitis. This is Amber Holloway with her sweet little girl, Adeline. She claims she took her then five-year-old to Vanderbilt Children's Hospital last year for a colonoscopy. She tells me months later, a Vanderbilt staffer told her Adeline might have been exposed to HIV or hepatitis B or C. Oh, that's my baby. She means a lot to me. I can't imagine something like that for her to have to live with the rest of her life. She tells me Vanderbilt staff told her on the phone first it was because of the equipment not being properly sterilized. There was some anger and some frustration. Then saying she received this letter from her My Health at Vanderbilt portal, making things real for her, pointing out the sterilization discrepancy. Could potentially expose a patient to viruses such as hepatitis B, C, and HIV. In the letter, she tells me Vanderbilt Medical Center apologized. What's your reaction to them saying my sincerest apologies? I mean, they can say that to everybody. Take accountability for it. Adult patients reached out to Fox 17 News, telling us they received the same news. Vanderbilt Medical Center responded by saying staffers, quote, immediately corrected the issue, end quote. And the issue was in how a solution was administered through the scope during a limited number of endoscopy procedures, less than 4% over the last six months, notifying patients immediately. We asked Vanderbilt about possible exposure at their children's hospital and outside of the six month window, responding, quote, we are unable to answer any additional questions, end quote. Even though Holloway's child tested negative, she says it's not over for her yet. I would like to see uh, the, my, my child and every other patient that was involved to have justice for it. Holloway tells me she plans to file a lawsuit. Reporting live in Nashville, Karen Aguilar, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. New tonight, a battle is brewing between Nashville City leaders and Tennessee's Attorney General Jonathan Scrimetti. Back in 2022, the AG's office says that Immigration and Customs Enforcement on the federal level wanted to bring some detainees to Tennessee from a facility in Louisiana. He says that ICE had contacted Metro City leaders ahead of time before state lawmakers helped to derail the plan. We have laws that are supposed to let us ensure that the people who come into the country are not dangerous. And when those laws aren't followed and when we just have this unmitigated tide of people coming in, uh, we get dangerous people on the streets and bad things happen. National's mayor's office tells Fox 17 News that Metro was not working with ICE on this. City leaders say, in fact, they were in communication with ICE only to understand the possible impacts this could have on the city. just like setting a trap and seeing if this individual will get caught up in the trap. 
In Operation Crime and Justice tonight, questions about whether the man Metro Police say hit and killed a 10 year old girl on her scooter will ever be brought to justice. Metro Police believe their suspect has fled the country. Fox 17 News Kylie Walker in studio now after Metro Police say they arrested the suspect's nephew who they indicate helped his uncle get out of the country. The nephew told police he drove his uncle from Nashville to Atlanta to buy a bus ticket to Texas so he could then cross the border into Mexico and continue into Honduras where he's originally from. Now that's the very place that has cut an extradition treaty with the US. 10 year old Emily Sanchez Ramirez tragically lost her life this month when police say 39 year old Walter Daenerys Zuninga crashed into her and her mother who were riding a scooter in a bike lane. The hit and run driver took off and is believed to be back in his home country. And this individual left and he's out of our grasp. There's nothing more frustrating for law enforcement and the family. Former FBI agent Scott Augenbaum highlighting the challenges for law enforcement ahead. If this individual decides he's not going to leave Honduras, there's really unfortunately not much that could be done. In late August, Honduras announced the end of a century old extradition treaty with the U.S. after a dispute with an American diplomat. Going through Interpol, you were able to put a red notice in, which means if these individuals do travel to another foreign country that we have a relationship with, they can be brought back to the United States. So there is some hope that way. Earlier this month, Emily's father spoke with me through an interpreter. Jason Sanchez pleaded for the suspect to come forward. A person who is well aware of what they do, they don't do what he did. By having the kind of heart that he had of just hitting them and just leaving, leaving them. With the suspect's fate uncertain, Verna Wyatt from Tennessee Voices for Victims says this is a lasting pain. There's so many victims that never get their offender apprehended, and they go decades with that pain because they want justice for their person that they love. It is a special kind of hurt, and it never goes away. Now the suspect's nephew has turned himself in. Police say that he admitted to his involvement and is now charged with accessory after the fact, along with other charges. For now, reporting in studio, Kylie Walker, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. Kylie, thank you. New tonight, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers hosts a public hearing in Gallatin on its proposed Foxland Harbor Marina project. The Army Corps shared results of its environmental study, which concluded that adding a marina at Foxland Harbor around the number one boat ramp would have no significant impact on Old Hickory Lake. Some locals, however, disagree. They point to the need to dredge the area to accommodate hundreds of boats that would be coming in. Others worry about the small launch area just off Gallatin Road. This one is the most inadequate document I have ever reviewed. It has no level of detail. It glosses over the impacts and comes to an unsubstantiated minor impact conclusion. This would be a great benefit to not only us, I think to the community um, for the future growth of this with a, a a lake that's over 22,000 acres and 97 miles of river length. Now tonight's meeting was to determine if the Corps' assessment had missed anything that should be considered. No word yet on when a final decision on this new marina project will be made. Katie? It's not another beautiful afternoon, but Another dry day. We really could use some rain and it just has not been in the cards for the month. 25 days straight with no rain in the rain gauge at BNA. We've gone the entire month of October so far without a drop of rain. If we were to finish the month, it'd be the first time ever that happening. Uh, but we are now tied with the ninth longest streak of uh, dry days consecutively. And it is the longest stretch in 23 years of dry weather that we have had. As we get into tomorrow, though, the potential for a few showers will exist. So our streak here in jeopardy. Things are quiet now, but we are watching this front here that is developing out in the plains and will head our way, offering us a couple showers. It's not going to be a big rain for us, but it will be at least a chance. Broadway tonight, a little bit uh, busy out there and looking at temperatures uh, comfortable in those low 60s with clear skies. 
We're down to the low 50s for the overnight. We'll talk more about this rain chance walking you through the timing coming up. Scott. Katie, thank you. Just ahead, fall fun fit for the entire family. Say that three times. What you can find on a special farm in Rutherford County. And some frantic moments, a new look at the chaos in the failed assassination attempt against former President Donald Trump. Fox 17 News Farrier Files is sponsored by Bart Durham Injury Law. For many of us, going to a farm for a fall outing is something of a family tradition. Agro-tourism in Tennessee is a big and a growing business. Now, one of Middle Tennessee's most impressive fall outings like that can be found at Lucky Lad Farms in Eagleville in Rutherford County. Here's Fox 17 News Dennis Farrier with the story in tonight's Farrier Files. A pumpkin patch and a corn maze? Absolutely. That's always on the fall farm checklist, but Lucky Lad goes way beyond that with attractions that are simply one of a kind. It is so cool! It wouldn't be a fall farm without pumpkins. Without a tractor ride to the pumpkin patch and an old-fashioned petting zoo. But Lucky Lad Farms goes way beyond that. Self-locomoting pigs. A tricycle track. A barn slide. A giant jump mat. A twist on a tractor pull. A bubble making station. Oh my gosh, Coulter, that was huge! A sea of corn? You can just sit under a tree and watch the kids play if you're tired like me and <laughs> having to get good exercise here as many times as she wants to climb that slide. But uh, yeah, it's really great and uh, we love it and uh, it's kind of our time, isn't it? When it's Grammy Day. Lucky Lad Farms is a place to wear out the kids and yourself. Nobody seems bored and the electronic devices are shockingly forgotten. Been having an absolute blast wearing the kids out. <laughs> you look like you're having fun. Oh yeah, we're having fun too. The bubbles, the slides, all of it. Every bit of it. This is the big idea behind Lucky Lad. Create a place where everyone puts the phone down, except for pictures, and gets active. We just really wanted to have something special for the community, and um, we believe if we're gonna do something, we wanna do it well, and so we're constantly learning from other farms across the, the world, really, um, and um, trying to find new ways to um, not only educate but entertain folks when they come out. And maybe confuse people a little. Lucky Lad Farms is known for its award-winning corn maze. Walking through a corn maze is fun, but you don't see the artistry of the corn maze because you're looking at the corn at eye level. We have an answer for that. We brought our Fox 17 drone to Lucky Lad Farms so you could see all that went into this amazing corn maze. So we call it the Lucky Lad Loop-de-Loop. -loop. <laughs> and it's just a bunch of concentric circles that are gonna keep you kind of spinning around and around. And it makes it just really challenging because you're not sure um, whether you've just gone left or gone right and, and um, how to figure your way out of these um, circles. Sure enough, we found a group of boys who struggled in loop-de-loop -loop limbo. You guys get through it or no? Tell me the truth. No, we, no. we, no. we, we, went, we got this way. We got but through the entrance. Back. thought we were supposed to go somewhere. Conquered by the maze, pointing fingers at each other. What a great story to tell for years. I think the thing that we're most proud of is that we get to be part of so many memories. So we really do, that. that's what keeps it going for us, is knowing that families are coming out, friends are coming out, and there are these memories that are being made, um, and they're going to cherish those forever. This will be a fantastic weekend to get out to Lucky Lad Farms. We'll put the hours on our website. I'm Dennis Ferrier, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. Dennis, thank you. Lucky Lad had to close for a short time. You may remember after the tornado outbreak in May, the farm at the time suffered a lot of damage as that twister tore through parts of Eagleville. Fox 17 News Ferrier Files is sponsored by Bart Durham Injury Law. Well, we always want to know what you think. Halloween next week, and we are asking in our question of the day, have you carved a pumpkin yet at your place? Just a little under 200 people are weighing in. The vast majority say, no, we have not done that yet. Fortunately, you still have time. Only 12.8% say, yes, we have. If you'd like to weigh in and let us know well, where you stand, scan the QR code on the right-hand side of your screen. It will take you directly to the Fox uh, page on X, our handle at Fox Nashville, and we will update the numbers for you tonight on Fox 17 news at 10.
Now let's talk about your weather. Dennis was talking about what a great weekend it was going to be to do something outside. It just sort of continues. It's been a little warm last couple of days, though. Yep. Uh, tomorrow we're looking at a record high. So that area. continues. All that right. continues. But going into the weekend, we're going to cool down because there's a front coming in. So now you're talking. Yes. Nice weekend, uh, but we'll be right back into the 80s. It looks like next week and uh, a little later on, we'll talk about what uh, the beginning of November holds for us, how we're trending as far as temperatures go. Really pretty shot here from our Nissan Stadium camera this evening. Record warmth on the way for tomorrow. As I mentioned, the record is 84. We're going to best that, I think, by a few degrees. But along with it, we've got a front that's coming through. It's going to help push these numbers into the mid to upper 80s and a chance for a few showers to go along with it. Again, we could use the rain. We have been dry for quite a while and uh, we're starting to see that more reflected in our drought conditions here. This has uh, been updated today, so it comes out every Thursday. And I expect it to worsen a little more as we get into next week, given the fact that our rain chances remain slim to none. We take a look here and this is the latest model run from future track. This afternoon we had a few little uh, pillars here that were showcasing at least a sprinkle or two possible and now future track has took them. They've taken them out. So that gives you the idea that again we're looking at a very uh, scattered chance for a shower. Uh, sparse across the area. So uh, 7 a.m. We'll start the day dry. It's going to be sunny for much of the afternoon. Here's three o'clock. You can see the front and a few showers here in Kentucky. But as we get into the evening hours, we just don't have a lot of moisture to work with. So a lot of the rain that we may see to our north and west for the afternoon should most likely dissipate by the time it gets to us. Here's Friday night, a couple clouds moving in, a spot shower possible. So it really is going to come down to whether or not one of those spot showers falls over the airport uh, weather station. That's where we get our climatology. And if it does, then we can mark it down as a day that we did receive measurable rain. Uh, but the chances look pretty low that we'll see those showers around 6 a.m. We may end up with a few showers early on and then those push out as we head into Saturday afternoon into early uh, Saturday evening here. I do think we'll look at a little more cloud cover than earlier anticipated in the week for Saturday. So the cloud cover will probably linger a little longer through the day. But again, the rain chances remain pretty small uh, through the afternoon, even on Saturday. So forecast tomorrow again, 87 degrees. The record is 84 set back in 1973. Looks like we've got another record day on the way for tomorrow. More on what the beginning of November is looking like, along with your Halloween forecast. That's all coming up. 911 audio from the Trump rally shooting in Pennsylvania has been released. I'm Atrell Nashar with the fresh perspective of the chaos in Butler. Tonight we are getting a better understanding of the frantic moments after a gunman fired at former President Donald Trump during a rally a couple of months back in Pennsylvania. Fox 17 News Atra Elnashar with the 911 calls from that day. What happened? Gunshots at the Trump rally. Yep, the, the police are on the way. Well, you better get, better get over here quick. 911 audio of the moments panic set in at the Butler Farm Show grounds on July 13th. They just tried to kill President Trump. I might want to make a note of that. We're now able to hear this audio because several news outlets sued Butler County to release it. Rally attendees terrified about what just happened to former President Trump and the people around them, like this woman whose husband was shot. Hey, this is Allegheny County. I have a female on the line. Her husband was shot at the Trump rally. Go ahead, call her. Paramedic service, Tim. I called Butler Hospital. He's not there. They told me to call 911. Please don't hang up. And this woman. Hello, we have an emergency. Okay, what We're happen? at the Trump rally. We're in the field. We have a 90-year-old woman down. Are you conscious right now? She is. She doesn't know where she's at. The release of this audio comes as multiple investigations, including an independent panel, a Senate committee, and a House task force pieced together what happened. Pennsylvania Republican Congressman Mike Kelly, whose district includes the site of the shooting, leads the bipartisan House task force, which just released its interim findings on the actions of Secret Service and local law enforcement leading up to and during the shooting. Everything you look at that day was out of place from where the perimeters were set up for how we were going to communicate. Retired Secret Service Special Agent in Charge Frank Loveridge. We are an agency in crisis. 
that we don't have the resources, the human resources, to staff properly all of our protective operations. He says he wants to know who in management is responsible for these systemic issues and not being more strategic with technological assets. There's cameras, intrusion detection that is out there, cameras with infrared. Congress recently approved additional funding for the Secret Service, but investigators and experts agree money alone cannot solve the shortcomings at the agency that allowed for now two attempted assassinations of former President Trump. On Capitol Hill, I'm Atra al -Nashar. Booming early voting numbers in parts of the mid-state. The part of Rutherford County, however, not seeing the rush. Coming up after the break, what DeAndre Hopkins said as he got introduced to the Kansas City Chiefs, including a comment about playing meaningful football. I'm Jill Jelnick. I'll have that and more coming up next. In election news, early voting has been strong statewide since it kicked off last week. In fact, some counties are seeing records broken daily, but the heavy turnout is not universal. A couple of precincts in Murfreesboro are so far the exception to the rule. Joining us now with more on the early voting numbers there is MTSU journalism professor Ken Blake, who's teaching his students how to interpret the data from the County Election Commission day by day. Ken, thank you for doing this, and if you will, tell us what you have observed about uh, the voting patterns and what I understand is central Murfreesboro. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I'm uh, glad to be on. Uh, yeah, so my students and I are looking at the, uh, the the daily releases that we get from the Rutherford County Election Commission on uh, 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 voting totals for the day, and we're breaking those down by precinct in Murfreesboro. And as you alluded to, not all precincts are uh, are showing the same levels of turnout. Uh, specifically, it's really the precincts in central Murfreesboro, around the Murfreesboro Courthouse, if you're familiar with Murfreesboro, uh, the area around MTSU, where, where I'm sitting right now, um, and, and the Patterson Park community area, which is just a little bit to our south. Um, <clears throat> those are those are the areas kind of in central Murfreesboro, and voter turnout r there right now is sitting at about 13% or so. Um, and uh, elsewhere in the county, especially in the outlying uh, areas of the county, it's, it's up in the 20s, 20, 25 percent. That's a big disparity. Now, how are your students responding to what's essentially data-driven reporting that you're exposing them to in real time? And, uh, and this is real-life stuff. A lot of people are voting here, and very few are voting in the core. Yeah, I, you know, I, I do think they're interested in the live data. Um, and of course, like as with any class, there's a range. Um, I have some students who are who are active in, in student media. Uh, they're actually publishing these results and, and updating them live. Uh, they're pretty engaged. Um, I've, I've got some others who are, you know, non-journalism <laughs> students, for example, who are uh, less interested. The point of the class really is to teach them how to use data analysis and, and uh, the, the R programming language, which is the, the language that we're using. Uh, and, and, and the election focus is, of course, just a timely focus because there's an election going on. Um, but I, I do think they're interested and, um, and, and, and I think they're engaged. They're, uh, those who have access to media are writing about it. And what I hope they're learning really is, is I hope they're getting introduced to R and introduced to data journalism in particular in ways that they can uh, sort of take things forward. And, you know, we can only hope that this will encourage them to vote as they get out of school and into their daily lives because it's important and you're sort of underlying how important. I say that all the time. I say if you haven't really voted yet, uh, you, you, you can see that uh, the, the campus area is sort of lagging behind. Get out there and do your part. Um, I, I voted on uh, early voted on Friday at the Rutherford County Election Commission. No wait, reserve parking out front, and I got a sticker. It was fantastic. I'm planning and, uh, to do and, the and, same. Yes, I'm planning to do, do the same. Yes. Yeah. All right. MTSU journalism professor Ken Blake, I appreciate what you're doing with the kids, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes, and uh, you know you you might invite your, uh, your 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 viewers to to check out the website. I'll be updating it nightly now until October 31st, the end of early voting in Tennessee. Will do. DeAndre Hopkins' time in Nashville is officially over. Titans said today that the trade is complete, and in exchange for Hopkins, the Titans will receive a conditional fifth-round pick that could become a fourth-rounder. Now, Hopkins was already introduced in Kansas City earlier today, and he was asked, what does it mean to come to a Super Bowl-winning team? Now, he may not have meant it, but Hopkins' answer came off a little bit like a dig against the Titans. But I'll let you be the judge. It uh, means a lot. Uh, it takes your game to a different level. Uh, it takes your, 
your focus, your drive, uh, knowing that you're playing for something. Uh, it, it takes a game to a different level. Uh, I haven't played meaningful football in a couple of years uh, since, you know, we probably started 8 0 in Arizona. Uh, so, you know, it takes a game to a different level. We'll have to follow up with D Hop on exactly what meaningful football means, but either way, D Hop is now officially a Kansas City Chief. As for the Titans, they are gearing up to face the Detroit Lions on Sunday, and it's not looking good. Quarterback Will Levis limited for the second straight day, and it's looking like Mason Rudolph will get the start at QB. Also, wide receiver Calvin Ridley did not practice the last two days because of a foot injury. Also, not good news because the Titans are already down two receivers with Hopkins gone and Traylon Burks on the IR, so something to keep an eye on. Vanderbilt quarterback Diego Pavia was added to the Manning Award watch list today, an award that's given annually to the nation's top quarterback. Pavia has led the 25th ranked Vanderbilt Commodores to its best start since 2008, as well as the program's first top 25 ranking since the 2013 season. Doors, though, will have their work cut out for them this weekend. They welcome in the fifth ranked Texas Longhorns to First Bank Stadium on Saturday. And women's professional basketball is coming to the Music City this February. And today, Athletes Unlimited held a kickoff party to help celebrate the upcoming season. I was there. Very cool event. And Athletes Unlimited is a women's professional basketball league that takes place in the offseason of the WNBA so that players can compete over here and not have to go overseas. They held the league in Vegas and Dallas the previous three years. And now players tell me they're excited to be coming here in Nashville. It's been a lot of work getting us to Nashville and the excitement is something that we haven't felt in previous cities. I mean, we had great experiences in Dallas and in Vegas, but the welcoming, the, this whole event, this welcome week is something that we've never done before. So to have Nashville and Tennessee so excited to have us come here just means a lot to us. Very cool welcome weekend event that I got to be a part of and I'll have much more on Athletes Unlimited League coming up closer to the start of their season, which by the way will take place February 5th. Jill Jelnick, Fox 17 Sports, your Code Red station. I think it's pretty cool she got to uh, host that event. That was really neat. Uh, let's start off here with a look at Find the Cold Front. Well, I kind of gave it away. I put the front on there for you, but you can easily see where we've got some cooler air here in Nashville and uh, just to the north and west, the front sits here and that's where all the warm air is in front of the cold front. And that is going to move our direction for tomorrow, which is one of the reasons why we will see a big warm up, a good 10 degree jump between today and tomorrow, likely or near 10 degrees. Then on the other side, we've got cooler weather to enjoy, which means pretty nice setup for the Vanderbilt game uh, against Texas, a big game this weekend at Vanderbilt Stadium. This will be at 315. I do think we're looking at a partly to mostly cloudy sky that should help keep temperatures down a few degrees as well, topping off in the low 70s for the day. But as we get into the evening hours, we'll start to see those numbers drop. The cloud cover will begin to clear as we head deeper into the afternoon and more so into the evening hours as well. So overall looking to be a pretty nice day for football. Thought I would give you a quick reminder too that we are just over a week away from setting those clocks back once again. So uh, tomorrow sunrise will be at 704 sunset at 557 Sunday, November 3rd, a week from Sunday sunrise is 612 and sunset 448 in the afternoon. <laughs> we'll talk more about how the beginning of November temperature wise and rain wise is looking in your Fox 17 code red forecast. Also ahead, keeping order the plan American Airlines has to keep people from jumping line when they board and swimming in debt. What has so many Americans under water? In consumer news tonight, American Airlines is testing out a system to prevent passengers from essentially jumping line when folks are boarding. I'm sure you've seen this happen. The technology is designed to catch travelers who are boarding the plane before their group is called. Now, if people do that, the system will play an audio signal which alerts the gate attendant. The person that has done that will be sent back in line. The airline is testing the plan right now in Virginia and also in New Mexico. 
Update now on the deadly Baltimore, Maryland bridge collapse from back in March. The owner and the manager of the cargo, cargo ship that caused the collapse has agreed to pay more than $100 million to settle a lawsuit brought by the U.S. Justice Department. The state of Maryland is currently suing for $2 billion for money to rebuild the bridge. The Justice Department says that the owner and manager knew that boat had serious electrical issues but did nothing to address them. Six men on a road crew who were on top of the bridge when it fell died in that crash. Coming up, we'll talk more about the beginning of November. Also ahead, looking at your Halloween forecast. Child care costs, rent, student loans, even groceries. Inflation is hitting Americans hard. I'm Angie Moreski. Spotlight on America investigates what's driving Americans so deep in debt and what can be done about it. Financial experts say many Americans these days are dealing with record levels of credit card debt. Tonight in Spotlight on America, our Angie Moreski looks at what's driving that debt and who is impacted the most. Hey, buddy! Dia Rucco has a beautiful family and home in the suburbs of Virginia. Oh, sure, thanks. Thanks, buddy. But over the past several years, her American okay. dream has been weighed down by crushing debt. Did you feel like you were literally drowning in debt? Literally drowning. This one was over $18,000 on one credit card. Shortly after Dia and her husband bought their home in 2019, she started racking up credit card charges, trying to keep up with escalating child care costs and unexpected home repairs. All these little things that had to get paid for, I just kept using a credit card. And it just got to a point where I, I was feeling like sick to my stomach from the stress of it all. Dia ended up with nearly $90,000 in credit card debt, plus another 100,000 in student loans. And she is not alone. New data shows total credit card debt for Americans hit a record $1.14 trillion in the second quarter of 2024, the highest since the New York Fed started tracking it 25 years ago. How bad is it? It's a lot worse than what it was last year, that's for sure. Naomi um, Peden is a debt relief counselor with Money Management International, a nonprofit that helps people develop plans to pay off their debt for a fee. We see more young people, more middle class people. During the pandemic, Americans flush with cash from government stimulus actually started paying down their debt for a brief period of time, but then around mid-2021 started running it right back up again. In just three years, revolving consumer debt has jumped nearly 40 percent, the biggest spike ever, hitting the highest amount ever. Increase in expenses. Peden says inflation has been a major factor, leading many consumers like Dia to use credit cards to supplement their income to pay for everyday expenses. I could not keep up with it. And while inflation is now cooling, Peden says many people aren't feeling the benefit yet because consumer prices are still up 21% since February of 2020. Increase in food, the increase in gas, the increase in other expenses, just regular monthly expenses. Yes. How realistic is that when you're so deep in debt to get out? It's very realistic. Dia decided she needed help and created a debt management plan with professional assistance from MMI. They were able to get her credit card interest rates, some as high as 30 percent, negotiated down to under 10 percent, and she's been faithfully paying them off ever since. I'm on track and I will be done in just a few more months. That's an incredible freeing feeling. Not easy, but worth it to enjoy a future with her family. Did you read the card? Debt free. You think that's for you? For Spotlight on America, I'm Angie Moreski. Yeah, okay. you... As we get uh, a little closer to the weekend, we tend to check out our Broadway camera a little more and uh, it becomes a little more busy as we get into Thursday and more so Friday night. Uh, but looking uh, fairly lively this evening here, uh, every now and then I'll see a, a car that drives by. I don't know if you've been downtown recently and you've seen this. A car that drives by it has a music video playing on it. Uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, but uh, definitely looking nice and quiet as far as the weather goes for this evening. A little comfortable too. Let's start off with a curveball here, shall we? Uh, we've got the first 
World Series game on Fox 17 tomorrow night. And uh, this will be in L.A. as the Dodgers take on the Yankees at 7 p.m. Temperatures look to be in the mid-60s with a mostly cloudy sky and looking at increasing clouds and a relatively cool evening as the night wears on for L.A. standards. Uh, but uh, not too bad. Uh, weather wise there in LA for game one. Let's take a look now at our Halloween thoughts. We're a good week away now from Halloween and uh, it's looking not, not too bad. In fact, warmer than average, most likely a nice day with temperatures near if not a little above average upper 70s to around 80 degrees and looking at the potential for some rain late. There might be a rain chance models are hinting at for Thursday night into Friday which would be interesting if we end up being dry for tomorrow, if we stay dry uh, to the final day of October. So we'll be watching that. But for now, I do think Halloween for the most part is going to be dry uh, for trick or treat time. So uh, Halloween, I don't know why that says Sunday. It is not Sunday, it is Thursday. Halloween is uh, uh, this upcoming Thursday, so a week from today. And sunset is going to be at 551. Temperatures here around 75 at 4 o'clock, 70 degrees at 6 and into the mid 60s as we head into uh, the evening hours. Pretty nice Halloween shaping up for us. The month so far has been pretty Pretty warm. All these little boxes that you see here in orange, those are above average conditions. We had a small stretch of below average temperatures here from the 14th through the 17th, but everything else has been above average and dry. Not one single day this month have we seen any rain. Uh, for the month of October. So then it got me to thinking, what is it looking like as we head into the beginning of November? It does look like our above average conditions will continue into the first week here. So the first through the seventh, uh, we are looking at above average conditions as far as temperatures go and slightly above average possibilities here for rain chances. So most of those rain chances look to be more to the central plains, but some of the long range models that I've been looking at have hinted at some rain chances headed our way within about a week. Here's a look at your seven day forecast. I did go ahead and put a 20% chance on Halloween Thursday, but it does look like right now that it'll be late Thursday night into Friday. Amazon delivering a new perk for customers, how it could save you money on your commute. And it uh, looks like they missed the stop sign. The chaotic crash caught on camera. In consumer news tonight, Amazon is gassing up its prime membership with a brand new perk. Listen to this. The e-commerce giant says that members can save 10 percent a gallon on nearly 7,000 gas stations around the country. Amazon says these discounts will be available at all BP, Amico and AMPM stations. Customers are looking to save a little at the pump have to link their prime memberships to their Earnify account, which is an BP rewards program. <coughs> Excuse me. Game one of the World Series is tomorrow here on Fox 17. Our coverage starts right after Fox 17 News at 530. After that, we've got college football. Rutgers taking on the University of Southern California. That is right after the World Series game. Now, because Fox 17 uh, will not be able to air because of the World Series at 9 o'clock, you can catch Fox 17 News at 9 on our sister station, CW Nashville. You can also see a rebroadcast of that newscast here on Fox 17 after the football game. Now on Saturday, college football, a doubleheader for you here on Fox. Nebraska taking on Ohio State at 11. Then it's Texas Tech versus Texas Christian University in the afternoon game at 2.30. Then on Saturday night in prime time, game two of the World Series. Our coverage of game two will begin at 6. Then on Sunday, the Titans are back on Fox 17 Sunday. Don't miss the two-tone blue battling against the Detroit Lions. That team is red hot. That game will start at noon. Still ahead, a late night scare. What led to this crash that was caught on camera? Caught on camera, hit and run crash after a car slams into a house in Massachusetts. Take a look at the video. It shows the car slamming into the steps right in front of a woman's house. Happened about 2 o'clock in the morning. Shortly after the crash, the driver gets out and runs off. Luckily, nobody inside the house got hurt again. It just hit the front steps there. Police have the license plate on the car, of course, and they're now trying to figure out who was behind the wheel. 
Tightening polls in October show a troubling trend for Democrats. I'm Matt Gelka in Washington, and I'll have the story coming up. How would Vice President Kamala Harris be different from President Joe Biden? I'm Christine Frizzell with why some say she has yet to answer that question. <laughs> 